This episode of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Patreon supporters and listeners like you. If you enjoy Hellbent for Horror, please consider supporting the show by contributing either on our Patreon site or via PayPal. You can find links to both of those on hellbentforhorror.com. And I thank you for helping to sustain the show. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. If you're interested in supporting the show, go to my website and click the support button. And if you follow me on Twitter, there's a link to my Patreon site on every episode post I do. And we give you stuff for your support, including your own personal direct play link for the episodes. Yay! There's also more than one way to support the show. If you are a listener who enjoys what we do, I have a favor to ask. Libsyn, the podcast host for Hellbent for Horror, is trying to get demographic information to help my show find the right third-party sponsor. If you could, please go to survey.libsyn.com forward slash hellbent for horror and fill out the short survey. I'll also have a link to the survey on the Hellbent for Horror webpage, which is hellbentforhorror.com. It's a simple way to help out the show, and I thank you in advance. So as you can tell, I've been kept pretty busy spreading the word about Hellbent for Horror, and that brings me to say that I'm looking for an intern to help with some of the creative marketing that I do on social media. If you're interested, feel free to email me at scott at hellbentforhorror.com or DM me on Twitter. And now, on with the show. Ever since movies came into existence, there have been books that change how we think about movies and how we watch them. For better and worse, critics like Andrew Saris and Pauline Kael and Andre Bazin wrote books that influenced filmmakers and audiences for generations. However, there is one book that is largely forgotten that I argue is just as influential as Bazin's What is Cinema has been to how we watch movies. It came out in 1980, and after it hit bookstores, a new film culture was created. It is Michael and Harry Medved's The Golden Turkey Awards. If you like Mystery Science Theater 3000 or the Razzie Awards, or you watch Tommy Wiseau's The Room and you throw spoons at the screen, you can thank the Medved brothers. This book was the first time anyone acknowledged a specific brand of cinema that most critics and movie moguls would like to forget. These are movies that fell short of their creative mark by a mile. The cinematic train wrecks. The turkeys. Now, the book was a runaway hit because it legitimized a guilty pleasure that many of us movie lovers have. We have a soft spot for bad movies. Well, let me clarify that. I don't really like bad movies. Terminator Salvation is a bad movie, completely gutting a once-proud franchise. Transylvania 65000 is a bad movie, full of comic actors I love and no laughs in sight. I don't like those bad movies. I like a certain strain of bad movie. The movies I'm talking about may be technically inept, and they might have bad acting, and they might be absurd to the point of being incomprehensible. But even with those things against them, they are still entertaining. They may not be entertaining in the way the director originally intended, but they are still entertaining. To me, the only truly bad movie is a boring movie, and the multiplexes are full of them. And maybe that's why the term turkey was used by the Medved brothers, to make a distinction between the forgettable bad movies and these jaw-droppers. It's obvious these critics wear their mockery and artistic superiority on their sleeves. For one thing, they wrote a book about these movies instead of just ignoring them like everybody else, knowing that people would be curious to see them. And if that isn't enough, they created a fake movie that they included in the book. That fake film was entitled Dog of Norway, featuring Mookie, the Wonderhound. Now that's a labor of love. Obviously, these turkeys don't have universal appeal. But I'm not surprised that a lot of real movie lovers, the cineasts, do. Because we love movies, we love the language of film, and we watch anything we can find. And when you do that, 
you see a lot of stuff that sucks. But what really sucks is how derivative so many movies are. There are so many uninspired retreads out there that they tend to blur together. And that happens a lot in horror movies where you have the same setup and the same jump scares. If film is a language, it's like knowing the punchline to a joke as soon as it's being told. It doesn't matter who stars in it. It doesn't matter how good looking it is. It's still boring. And maybe that's part of the appeal of these turkeys. They are thoroughly unpredictable because the people making them do not know how to speak the language. Underneath all the errors in taste and technique is someone compelled to make a movie. An average Joe like you and me who is crazy enough to say, how hard could it be? They swing for a home run, even though they've never played baseball before. We may laugh at how silly they look, but we also secretly admire their effort. Well, some of them. Let's face it, some of them are just completely out of their minds. And speaking of being completely out of their minds, we come to me being out of mind. How I travel 2,000 miles to a quiet suburb of Chicago to watch a movie marathon of turkeys. The curdled creme de la creme of cinematic shipwrecks. Six of these movies in a row. So let me explain, if that's possible. A few years ago, I ventured to a horror convention in Chicago with the sole purpose of talking about horror movies to other fans. This was how I met a hardcore group of horror movie lovers that I unofficially dubbed the Algonquin Roundtable of Horror. These were film journalists and historians and graphic artists, just as obsessed as I was. And that's when I first met John Kitley, the proprietor of Kitley's Crypt. Now, I've talked about John Kitley in previous episodes, but here's an overview. John is a horror journalist who writes for magazines like Evil Speak and Horror Hound, and he contributed to the book Hidden Horror, a celebration of underrated and overlooked fright flicks. He's a film historian with an encyclopedic knowledge of horror films all the way back from the 1930s to the present. And John is also an avid movie memorabilia and book collector whose private collection was showcased on the pilot episode of Shout Factory TV's Horror Hunters. Now keep that in mind while you question my actions as we move on here. Every year since 2003, John hosts a movie marathon on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, called Turkey Day. He invites horror junkies and friends over to his screening room to watch cinematic turkeys. It became so popular, and just so much fun, that a second event was added, and Turkey Day in May was born. Now, while we were both at a convention one time, John offhandedly gave me an open invitation to attend, never thinking I'd be crazy enough to do it. Well, I'm not crazy enough to travel on Thanksgiving for something like that. But he and I both found out I'm just crazy enough to travel in May for something like that. Now, there were a couple reasons I decided to make the journey. See, I saw the pilot episode of Horror Hunters, where John's collection was showcased, among the hundreds of items in his museum. He had a prop from William Castle's movie, The Tingler. He has a tingler! I had to see this. But most of all, really, I went for the camaraderie. I would read blog posts about the Turkey Day celebrations and how much fun people had. And I read about extravagant pizzas made all through the day by John's family, like crab rangoon pizza. What does that taste like? And there was this unspoken oath that everyone took, that they promised to watch all the movies once they started. You can laugh at the movies, and you can make jokes, but you give them the respect of your viewing. On the surface, it reminded me of days long ago when my friends and I would get together and rent movies and the VCR, by the way, to play them on, and we'd stay up all night. Even if the movie sucked, the getting together, the event, was what mattered the most. And I think everyone in attendance at Turkey Day has had experiences just like that in their pasts. There we are, sitting in the dark, and most of us are wearing black. And we're surrounded by movie memorabilia, sacred objects. And we promise to watch eight to ten hours of bad movies and stay until the end, our pain and endurance turned into tribute. This is a ritual, and I needed to attend. 
Since I flew in before the event, I had time to get a tour of Kitley's Crypt. I knew I was in the right place when I saw the full-size cement gargoyle in the front yard. To be honest, I expected a large room where all the memorabilia was stored. I did not expect the total immersion, the total dedication to horror that John's home is. There is horror art, paintings and posters, on every wall, in every room. And like a museum, he rotates out the art to put more of the permanent collection on display. The bathrooms not only have lobby cards on the wall, but also towels with bloody handprints on them and a splatterific shower curtain. There is even a set of dinner plates with a Halloween theme to them. A man's home is his castle, but for John Kitley, his home is his unleashed id. But the downstairs office and the screening room are the main points of interest. The office is mainly dedicated to his tremendous collection of books on horror, numbering over 1,000 titles. And then there's the screening room. There is a row of authentic, old-fashioned movie theater seats bolted into the floor. There is a refreshment stand replete with a drive-in style menu board and a popcorn machine and an old glass display case. Except instead of candy, this display case is full of horror movie memorabilia. Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. The marathon starts early at 10 o'clock in the morning sharp, and so the guests arrive early. John's son, Nick, was the chef for the day, and he started us off with breakfast pizzas. Very tasty. In attendance was Neil Calderon, a member of the Chicago Cinema Society, which brings experimental and unconventional films to the city. Neil is also the proud owner of a private library of 35mm film prints. In fact, his rare uncut Italian print of Suspiria is out on tour across the country this year. Also in attendance was Jason Kaufman, author of the book The Unrepentant Cinephile. He's a regular contributor to Daily Grindhouse and Film Monthly and a member of the Chicago Independent Film Critics Circle. He's also the proud owner of a 35mm print of Andy Milligan's Guru the Mad Monk. And no, that wasn't one of the Turkey Day movies. When I asked attendee Matt Harding how he wanted me to describe him, he said this. 7th grade language arts teacher. Severn film smut dealer. Evil speak writer. I'll elaborate a little. He works with Severn Films, which specializes in rescuing and restoring some of the lost grindhouse and drive-in films. And Matt comes to the show bearing gifts in the form of Severn Blu-rays. I went home with a copy of Jess Franco's Blood Moon, also not one of the Turkey Day movies. Also in attendance was film reviewer and werewolf movie expert Craig J. Clark. He has a website called Craig J. Clark Watches a Lot of Movies which is truth in advertising, since he's watched close to 3,000. He's also contributed to the book Hidden Horror and to the monthly Full Moon Features column on werewolfnews.com. Lifelong horror film fan and Algonquin Roundtable member Brian Fucala was there, as was Brian Martinez, another Algonquin Roundtable member who creates and produces his own webcast called The Jalo Room. He's also making short horror films, and he is the creator of the horror blog Film Deviant. And then there was Aaron Christensen, who is better known as Dr. AC on his website Horror 101, which also has a companion book. Dr. AC is also an actor and the editor of the book Hidden Horror. He's also the longest Turkey Day attendee who has made the hellish sacrifice since 2005. And this year, he came with a surprise guest, his wife, Michelle. Now, even though Michelle is a horror fan and she contributed an essay on Brimstone and Treacle for the Hidden Horror book, she had never been to a Turkey Day event. And she was never expected to do so in a million years. Because Michelle doesn't have that weird mutation in the brain that the rest of us do when it comes to intentionally watching bad films. She is also an actor, and watching bad acting and inept production is like needles to her eyes. But due to rehab on recent knee surgery, Michelle tagged along to watch movies while her passive motion machine healed her joints. I think it worked like a giant stress ball for her myself. And as pizzas were brought to the food altar and the lights went down, the ritual began. 
The first movie up for sacrifice was B-movie legend Burt I. Gordon's first film, King Dinosaur, from 1955. Burt was the king of the giant monster and giant animal films. He used rear screen projection to create the illusion that actors or animals were giant-sized. And he used stock footage to add production value to movies that had non-existent budgets. Mr. Big, as he was known, went on to make classic drive-in movies like The Amazing Colossal Man and The Cyclops and Food of the Gods. But King Dinosaur proves that even if your nickname is Mr. Big, you gotta start somewhere. The story of King Dinosaur finds a new planet called Nova entering our solar system. Four scientists, who are married couples, fly to the planet to see if it's suitable to colonize. They find Nova to be just like Earth, which it is since the movie is shot in a field in California. To test the atmosphere, the astronauts remove their space helmets. At that moment, one of the guys in the audience said, God, this is already better than Alien Covenant. All is not just like Earth on Nova, however, as the group soon finds out. They are attacked by giant insects and giant snakes and a woolly mammoth that was from a clip originally used in the movie 1 million BC. But none of these encounters prepare them for the horror of King Dinosaur, which is, which is, uh, which is a giant iguana being propped up on its hind legs to simulate a T-Rex. Why couldn't it just be a giant iguana and crawl around normally? Because the script says it's a T-Rex, that's why. And why can't a giant alligator be a giant alligator instead of a triceratops? Only Bert I. Gordon knows for sure. King Dinosaur also features some old-school misogyny that is laugh-out-loud inappropriate. One of the male characters spends the entire movie pushing women out of his way and grabbing things out of their hands and pushing them to the ground for no reason. And for the animal lovers out there, there is a fight between King Dinosaur and the Triceratops that was obviously shot long before any animal rights groups were around. At 63 minutes, King Dinosaur flies along and has a lot of unintentionally funny moments. It is a true turkey deserving of its place on the platter. After a brief food intermission with more great pizzas from John's son, Nick, we jumped back into the darkness. The second Turkey Day movie was a low-budget horror film shot in Florida in the 1970s. Florida in the 1970s? Is it a Herschel Gordon Lewis film? Try again. Okay, if it's not Herschel Gordon Lewis, then it must be the other exploitation auteur from Florida. Is this a film by William Griffay, like Mako, The Jaws of Death? Uh, Not quite. But there is a William Griffay connection to the film we watched. In 1966, the writer and director of this film got his start in Griffet's Death Curse of Tartu. Yes, our second Turkey Day film was Brad F. Grinter's Blood Freak from 1972, the only Christian horror movie to initially get an X rating for violent content. I can only assume that either Brad Grinter paid someone off to get the X for publicity, or the X rating came from his church, not the MPAA. Yes. This is a church-funded horror film that wants to show how loose living and marijuana use will inevitably lead to poultry. Yeah, you heard me right. Poultry. It's an anti-marijuana movie that you'd swear they must have been stoned to even think up. And this leads me to the question of spoiler alerts. Is it necessary to give spoiler alerts to a turkey since the only reason you'd watch Blood Freak is because of its most absurd ingredient. Well, I'm going to tell you, because the plot just scratches the surface of the ridiculous experience of watching this movie. Blood Freak follows a straight-edge Vietnam vet biker named Herschel, who picks up a good Christian girl after her car breaks down. He takes her home to find out the good girl has a bad girl sister, and all her bad friends are at the house smoking pot. Now, Herschel survived the Viet Cong and the biker lifestyle without ever even trying marijuana. But when some pretty girl flirts with him, he starts token right away. And just like that, he's addicted to the weed. And before you know it, this biker falls in with a bad crowd. A bad crowd of uh, middle-aged scientists middle-aged scientists that are doing evil experiments 
in the middle of a turkey farm. One fateful night, Herschel makes a mistake that will forever change his life. He overeats. He eats an entire turkey himself. But that turkey is full of chemicals from the evil experiments, and he has a seizure. The scientists fear he's dead, so they dump Herschel's body in the woods. But Herschel isn't dead. Something far worse than death has happened. He has transformed. He is now addicted to the blood of other marijuana addicts, and he's murderously insane. And he now has a turkey head. No, he didn't find a turkey head on the ground, and he's carrying it around. No, he didn't find a turkey pinata, and he's wearing it like a mask. He's got a fucking turkey head. His head turned into a turkey head, and he gobbles because evil's a marijuana, right? Nobody is ever going to say that Blood Freak is derivative. As if things couldn't get any weirder, the director periodically cuts away from the action to a shot of himself sitting behind a desk smoking a cigarette while he comments on what we just saw, like Bella Lugosi in Glen or Glenda. It's the ultimate act of a narcissist who thinks he's an auteur. And that is one of the things that makes Blood Freak so hysterically entertaining. It is an 86-minute serving of humble pie that gets funnier every time Brad Grinter shows up to take a cocky, self-righteous puff off a cigarette. And if you watch this movie, watch it to the very end. The greatest belly laugh awaits you in the final minute of the movie. When Rosemary's Baby and Night of the Living Dead came out in 1968, they changed what a horror film could be. Those movies are the first blood of a new era that took horror out of the restrictions of gothic castles and rubber suit monsters. Those old tropes were unfortunately overused, and quite honestly, they just weren't scary anymore. The modern horror revolution was on. But not everyone got the memo. Our third turkey is Octoman from 1971. This movie not only pines for the golden days of movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, it basically rips off the story of Creature from the Black Lagoon, which is not surprising since writer-director Harry Essex wrote the screenplay to Creature from the Black Lagoon. Octoman feels like a movie out of time, any time. It tries to be contemporary with hip characters and violence, but the updates stick out like sore thumbs because everything else is up to 1954 standards. You even have superstitious natives in the form of Mexican villagers, and they're played by white guys doing Frito Bandito accents. The story follows researchers who travel to a Mexican fishing village to research the heavy radiation levels in the water. They find out that the radiation has created a mutated hybrid of man and octopus, and he's territorial, and he's looking for a cute date. The thing you most remember about Octoman is the monster. You can't help but remember the monster because he's shown every 30 seconds. But it's not because Octoman is a creature of great action. He stares at the researchers from behind some reeds at the water's edge and grumbles for a really long time. Sometimes he's just standing hip-deep in water, contemplating eternity. It's a page from the old Bert I. Gordon showmanship book that if you have anything, anything that adds production value, show it off as much as you can, because the creature is the best thing in the movie. And honestly, that's not saying much. The creature is one of the earliest creations by legendary makeup artist Rick Baker. Baker would go on to win an Oscar for making rubber suit monsters obsolete with an American werewolf in London. Now, it's not that the creature in Octoman is bad. It's just not particularly good, or at least not good enough to be in close-up in broad daylight. First off, he only has seven tentacles, which must be why he's so surly. And he's got a circular mouth that reminds one of Sid and Marty Croft's Sigmund and the Sea Monsters more than Creature from the Black Lagoon. Shallow. But in all honesty, this makes Octoman kind of charming. You won't get scared by the movie, but it has a fun vibe, like watching embarrassing home videos of a goofy relative. As bad as the movie is, when Octoman comes on screen, you get a silly smile. Octoman is a certified turkey. In every marathon, there comes a moment of truth, a moment where every fiber of your body tells you to quit. 
and you must make the conscious choice to push through until the pain dulls. Welcome to Turkey Number 4. How does one describe watching director Al Festa's failed attempt to revive the classic Giallo film as well as the Italian film industry with his 1996 movie Fatal Frames? Have you ever been to the World Pavilion at Disney's Epcot Center? It's a showcase of all the cultures of the world, and you think it's doing a good job until you go to the United States Pavilion. And all you see represented are riverboats and guys in straw hats singing barbershop quartets and people playing banjos. And you go, who in the hell thinks that's what America's like? And you realize that every nationality is probably saying the same thing about their pavilion. I think that's how fans of classic Jalo films must have felt when they saw Fatal Frames. It has very stylized camera work, like a classic Jalo film. It has a lot of scenes bathed in blue and red lights, just like a classic Jalo film. It has confused American actors doing awkward cameos, like a classic Jalo film. It has a masked killer with black leather gloves, just like a classic Jalo film. So, is Fatal Frames a classic Jalo film? No. You know what Fatal Frames is? It's about two hours and 20 minutes long, and that's what it is. At least an hour longer than it should be. And that kind of excess is all over Fatal Frames. The stylized camera work is so overdone it's absurd. And I'm positive every blue gel in Europe was used in this movie. And why stop with one confusing American actor cameo when you can have three? And if the lead actress, who also happens to be the director's wife, wants to promote her singing career with a music video in the film, why not do it three times? And surprise endings. Oh, you want surprise endings? We'll give you three of those, too. Unfortunately, one of them happens at the 90-minute mark, and there's still 40 minutes of this movie to go. Investors gambled on a big budget, and director Al Festa spent lira by the truckload. This was supposed to make a big splash internationally to revitalize the Italian film industry. What it did was leave a big crater where the Italian film industry used to be. Honestly, this is a rough one, especially with that running time. It's for the hardcore turkey junkies only, those that like endurance tests. Like that friend who drinks hot sauce from the bottle and then asks for a ghost pepper. After Fatal Frames, we licked our wounds with extravagant pizzas like the long-awaited Crab Rangoon. It was so good, it almost made Fatal Frames worth it. But it was back to business soon enough with our fifth turkey ready for display. Now this one, I have to say, was hard for me to see as a turkey because I held such fond memories of it as a child. The movie was Killdozer, a TV movie from 1974, and when I saw it as an eight-year-old boy, I was positive it was a perfect movie and it would never be topped. I looked at my Tonka toys with newfound respect after seeing Killdozer. The movie, based on a short story by sci-fi legend Theodore Sturgeon, is wonderfully ludicrous. A construction crew on a remote African island stumbles upon a mysterious meteorite. When they try to dig it out with one of the heavy-duty bulldozers, it emits some blue energy. One crew member is fatally burned by the radiation, which is then absorbed into the blade of the bulldozer. And then, chaos ensues as the bulldozer becomes a sentient killer, a killdozer. With a name like Killdozer, the movie has gained some infamy. It was mentioned both on Conan O'Brien and Beavis and Butthead, but not too many people have seen it. I will say that it held up better than I thought it would. Sure, the premise is absurd and the dialogue is hilarious. When one character asks how they're going to kill a machine, our hero says, it's too heavy to hang and it's too big to put in the gas chamber. Oh, chisel that one in stone, boys. But despite all of that and the jokey name, the movie is surprisingly intense and a little ruthless. There are moments of dread that echo the movie Duel in a very low-rent way. And it has a climactic battle between machines that will make the eight-year-old in you cheer. Killdozer is damn good turkey. And now we come to the last film in our stupefying cinematic sextet. And I will say it was very smart to end the marathon with this movie because, holy shit, after watching this movie, your brain will just tap out. 
from 1989. Deep in the woods of Nova Scotia comes director Andrew Jordan's Things. I don't even know where to start in describing this puppy. This movie isn't about the plot anyway, believe me. Attendee Jason Kaufman may have come up with the best description when he said this. It's like aliens tried to make a movie, but they didn't do enough research on how humans are supposed to act. What's astonishing is that I don't think there's one situation or action or reaction in the movie that isn't just flat out bizarre. People don't even sit in chairs normally. People store their winter coats and tape recorders in the freezer. One character plays tricks on his critically injured brother. And then a pregnant woman explodes while giving birth to giant ants with human mouths and pointy teeth. And the dialogue in this movie? Every conversation is like the scene in Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street when Leonardo DiCaprio and Jonah Hill take the powerful Lemon 714 quaaludes. But without the context of knowing they took quaaludes. And that's just scratching the surface of the incomprehensible absurdity of things. In fact, things is so consistently bizarre, it's like a statistical anomaly. What are the chances of every choice made in making this movie being hilariously wrong? It's like flipping a coin 50 times and never getting tails. It's like getting a zero on a multiple choice test with over 100 questions. Is there such a thing as perfect terrible? Can there be a purity of stupidity that is so consistent it attains an inner logic? If there is antimatter, things is anti-genius. If you do decide to watch things, don't watch it alone. It's not because it'll scare you. It's because you need at least one other person watching it so you can look at them and confirm that you haven't had a stroke and not getting blood to your brain. This is a movie that should only be seen with a crowd because part of the fun is turning to the person next to you and seeing that look on their face like they're trying to decipher important driving instructions in a foreign language. I watched Things alone in the 1990s and I turned it off within 10-20 minutes. I watched Things with a crowd of fellow turkey lovers and I laughed my ass off. Things was, hands down, the most entertaining turkey of the day. As the end credits say, you have just experienced things. And then the lights went up, and the ritual ended. We all gave each other sincere handshakes and hugs, because we enjoyed each other's company so much. We bonded, just like Titanic or Hindenburg survivors. But the real reason we enjoyed ourselves... We got to collectively relive a time when we watched movies with friends for the sheer joy of watching movies, when we weren't so aware of framing and exposition, when watching movies wasn't such serious business. Mostly, it takes us back to when we didn't take ourselves so seriously. We laugh at the movies and at ourselves for being in on the joke. See, turkey is good for you. And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. You can find Hellbent for Horror on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher, and other podcast platforms. And H4H has its own app. You can download it from the Google or Amazon store for Android, and the iPhone version is available on the iTunes store. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay hell-bent. <laughs>